We talked about grand theories or conceptual models in a previous video. So this video is going to look at what mid-range theories are, sometimes middle range or mid-range, either or. They're used interchangeably. So a lot of these middle range theories actually came from those really broad abstract conceptual models. And nurses realized that those conceptual models were kind of way so big that we couldn't use them for good practical purposes. And therefore, middle range theories came to be. And these were a little bit more so in the 80s and the 90s. And even today, researchers are building middle range theories. So they're more specific than those big grand theories, and we can actually use them to develop hypotheses for research or for developing interventions and research studies and things like that. Um, so they're, they're much more specific, but they're still applicable to a wide variety of nurses and patient kind of situations. So one common one that you might learn about is Beck's theory of postpartum depression. If you are a perinatal nurse, if you work in like postpartum or labor and delivery, family birth center, then I, it would be very good for you to understand what Beck's theory of postpartum depression says. So you can already see a difference. Those other ones that we looked at as grand theories or conceptual models were very broad. They were meant to apply to all nurses in all situations to say exactly what nursing is. Here, we're looking at one specialty and we're really trying to focus in on one smaller piece of the pie, if you will. These are some other middle range theories that you can see often used in nursing research. Um, Pender's health promotion model is quite common. Um, health promotion is one thing that we're constantly striving to do as nurses. We would hope that we could promote health and prevent illness rather than waiting for someone to get sick and then having to intervene after the fact. Um, also, Michelle's theory of um, uncertainty and illness is quite common. It has to do with the anxiety that patients feel when they're confronted with a newly diagnosed or worsening condition and they're scared. It's that fear of the unknown. It's just put into a nice theory package. And there are some others there, but we're really going to focus on those that I mentioned. So this is a pictorial representation of Pender's Health Promotion Model, or HPM. Um, basically, again, you can look at this, you can do some reading and figure out more so, but I'm not, I don't want you to be an expert on this model. I just want you to see kind of how it's laid out, okay? So patients come to us and they have had, they have things that they bring with them to their encounter with us. So they have their own personal factors, like their personalities and their weaknesses and their strengths and their fears. They bring that with them into the hospital or into the clinic. Okay, we have no control over that. That is them and their in internal environment. Okay, they also have their prior behavior. So if they've tried to lose weight before and they were unsuccessful, they're bringing that baggage with them into their encounter with you. But then they also have these things right here. And this is how, where we as nurses can kind of have a little bit of intervention. We can't do anything about these things but we can help them to see what their potential barriers are to making this healthy lifestyle change. We can help them to see that they do have the ability to make these changes and that it would be beneficial for them to start exercising or to stop smoking or to cut out concentrated sugars, okay? We can help them with interpersonal influences like helping them see which family members are good um, bad enablers of really bad behaviors so that they can have conversations with them and tell them stop bringing me these cakes I can't eat them okay so that this is where nurses can intervene according to Nola Pender's model and then both the nurse and the patient work together to bring a plan of action and to figure out exactly how the patient's going to get to the point that he needs to with the health promoting behaviors I mean if that doesn't sound like nursing practice I don't know what does because we're constantly fighting about a battle with helping to promote healthy lifestyles and having to counteract all of these other things that are going on. So to me, this model makes a ton of sense. It's way less abstract than those conceptual or grand theories, and we can use it to help actually make changes in our practice. I could use this model in, one, in my work with home health patients, perhaps. This one's Michelle's uncertainty and illness theory, and again, there's very specific things going on here. This is not so, so broad, 
But again, the whole, the main concept here is uncertainty. And there's a bunch of different ways that Michelle looks at uncertainty. He looked at uncertainty related to medical. So what's going on medically with the patient, the patient doesn't necessarily speak medicalese. So they don't understand all the big words that's being thrown out to them. But also practical, you know, my life in general is going to be turned upside down with what's going on with me. You know, I might not be as independent. I may not be able to work and support my family. Um, I may have to make modifications to my home and build a ramp. All those things are scary to patients. They don't know yet what all is going to be happening and changing with them. Um, psychosocial, you know, depression, anxiety, those are kind of hidden things that go along with the medical and the more obvious right in your face things. And of course, patients are um, bring religious and spiritual aspects as well. So we're really looking at a patient holistically and how that holistic patient experiences uncertainty. And where the healthcare provider comes in, according to Michelle, is, is, is in this little triangle. The caregiver plays an important role, but the patient is right here as well. So we have to have, we have to promote communication and relationship building among the caregivers, the families, the patients, and the healthcare providers. So that's us, that's physicians, that's physical therapists, speech therapists, everybody. So the nurse is paramount for making all of those little pieces of the triangle talk to each other. Because with the communication, the uncertainty diminishes. That's the ultimate goal here. Okay, We want the patient to feel prepared and not as scared. So how do we use these theories? We use them quite a bit in quantitative research, okay? Because these are very much less abstract. So we can actually use these to inform our research. So we can use the theory to create hypothesis that we then would test using data collection and statistical analysis. We can use it to make an intervention. We can use it to um, help us understand um, how to organize our our structure of our study. So here's some examples. This one is the use of Orem, I'm sorry, <laughs> of Orem self-care deficit nursing theory. Now that was one of those grand theories. Some researchers do use the grand theories or conceptual models as their frameworks. This one did. So they were looking at how the relationship between health literacy and the mother's ability to comprehend and communicate information about childhood immunization and they looked at it within Orem's theory. That's how they defined their concepts, okay? This one used Levin's conservation model of nursing as a lens with which they studied NICU infants. And then this one was looking at the health belief model and they were looking at barriers of um, some kind of health change. I'm not sure. I didn't read all of this. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that most of the time, is if there is a theoretical or a conceptual framework, it's going to be in the introduction of the article, and they should tell you what theory they used and how they used it um, to either develop hypothesis or their questionnaires or their interventions so that they could have a theoretical-based study. So these are just some examples. But you're going to come across these middle range theories. They're quite common. They're very useful for research. And also in this module, you're going to learn how they can be used for practice. Because we don't just use